If you are a person living with a disability, Access Adventure invites you to challenge your limits by coming aboard our wheelchair accessible horse drawn carriages and ride to anywhere wild. Nonprofit Access Adventure Director Michael Muir, great grandson of pioneer conservationist John Muir, who was green before the sky was blue, challenged the limits of his multiple sclerosis disability by traveling across the country in wheelchair accessible, horse drawn carriages from California to the White House. Working with Jerry and Barbara Garner, he developed battery operated wheelchair accessible carriages that enables persons with disabilities to explore the wilderness. No price of gas worries here. Horsepower for the carriages is supplied by Simpson Percherons, Belgian mares, draft and sport horses, and let's not forget about the mules. The Solano Land Trust 2,070 acre Rush Ranch and the Muir Heritage Land Trust preserved open spaces offers access adventure riders plenty of wild, wind, and the wonders of nature. By the way, the able body can join the fun. The rides are enjoyable and our programs are therapeutic and life altering, such as for this young man, living with cystic fibrosis and wasn't expected to see his 15th birthday. Now he cares for, helps to train, and drives some of our horses. Welcome to our challenge. Wheelchair accessible horse-drawn carriages. We're the only ones doing it. Oh, the rides at Rush Ranch are free.
I was born November 29, 1813, in the city of Loveland, Kingdom of Poland. My father, John Strenzel, was born in Pomerania in the year 1771. My mother's maiden name was Sophia Meisner. She was born in Loveland in 1785. They were married in 1803, were extensive owners of city property, and had a large family of children, but all died before reaching maturity, except myself, a sister, and our brother. My parents and grandparents were Protestant and brought up their children in the Lutheran faith, although residing in a Catholic community. Several of my uncles served with distinction in the Polish army, two as surgeons, and my great uncle reached the rank of general in the commissary department in the Russian army. The domestic conditions in my family were favorable, being attended with all desirable comforts. My parents lived very harmoniously. They were kind but firm with their children, order and decorum being observed at all times. My father owned an orchard and fruit garden near town, thus engendering in his children a love for country, life, and horticulture. My school days commenced at the age of six years, continuing uninterruptedly until my 17th year. My father intending me for a physician, my course of studies were directed to that end. My schoolmates and associates were the sons of officials and nobility. The revolution in Poland of 1830 changed the whole tenor of my future. I entered the army of volunteers and served until its final disbandment in 1831. The younger men who had joined the Patriot forces were immediately incorporated into the Russian army. With me, it was either this or exile from my native country. I chose the latter alternative, which was accomplished under serious difficulty. By the good offices of influential friends, I was permitted to reside in Napin, Hungary, for several years, gaining information in the wine trade and vineyard culture. I resumed my medical studies in the University of Pesh and was awarded a medical diploma. Broader fields of action now seemed offered by emigrating to America, and in the year 1840, I, with my brother, left Europe and came to the United States, landed at New Orleans, from there went to Louisville, Kentucky, joined the Peterson Colonization Company, and went with them to the Trinity River in Texas. I built a cabin on the site of the present city of Dallas and remained there one year, but the company failing and dispensing, I gave up and returned to the settlement. My stay on the Trinity River was very interesting. Fortunately, the Comanches were at that time several hundred miles further west on the plain, but left numerous camps full of bleaching bones. Buffalo in large herds roamed the country. My reminiscence of this frontier experience would be incomplete without mentioning a few of the sturdy pioneers with whom I was brought in contact in those days. Captain Bailey English, Dr. Rogers, Mr. Gilbert, Johnson, Montague, and many others who have long since departed to happier hunting grounds. On returning to the settlement, I located in Lamar County following my profession of physician and surgeon and purchased a homestead of 500 acres. On the 31st of December, 1843, I married Louisiana Irwin, born the 31st of October, 1821, in Lawrence County, Tennessee, which proved a most happy union. My wife's father, Samuel Irwin, was a Virginian who, when a young man emigrated to Kentucky, resided there a few years, married the daughter of General Rice, but she dying in about three years, he then went to the new Chickasaw Purchase on Western District of Tennessee, followed surveying for a number of years, and married the daughter of Mansell Crisp, and in 1837 removed with his family to Texas, to Fannin County, where he resided until his death in 1854. He was a large, fine-looking man, well-educated, gentlemanly, and courteous in deportment, and one of the most upright, honest men I ever knew. The mother was a delicate, refined woman, very domestic in her taste, very religious, a member of the Christian church, and thoroughly devoted to her family. 
the masterly and glowing description of the climate and resources of California, published in 1846 by Captain Fremont, first drew my attention to the Pacific coast. And, but the great distance and the unsettled state of the country at that time prevented me from attempting to go there. The discovery of gold in 1848, ensuring a rapid emigration from every part of the world to that faraway land, offered to me an, unexpe an unexpected opportunity of going. Early in the spring of 1849, a company was organized in our immediate vicinity, consisting of about 135 persons, including myself and family, all well equipped to emigrate to California. On the 22nd of March, all being in readiness, we bid adieu to our friends and home and commenced the long and perilous journey. There were nine women and 25 children in the train. The women were Mrs. Strenzel, Mrs. Dustine, Mrs. Harrison, Mrs. Davis, and her niece, Miss Helen Patty, Mrs. Moss, Mrs. Booth, Mrs. Budget, and Mrs. Shackelford. I think I have never known greater courage than was evinced by these brave women in undertaking, against the entreaties and advice of friends, to go with their children on a trialsome journey of more than 2,000 miles over a trackless wilderness through the midst of hostile Comanches and Apache Indians. We had not even a guide to direct us the way, nothing except a map and a compass to go by. The country was entirely unknown to us, not one of the party ever having been through it. The first 300 miles of the route lay through a fertile country, finely wooded with excellent grass and water, and we were unmolested by Indians but traveling was necessarily slow on account of heavy spring rains and severe storms. But the rest of the way, 500 miles to El Paso, was mostly an arid plain with little or no timber and a scarcity of water and grass, the water in many places so strong with alkali and salt that we could not use it. About the last of May, we all came near to being lost for want of water. We traveled two days and one night without finding any, and the previous camp had been at a salt spring so brackish we could not possibly drink it. We had made it a rule to take with us from camp every morning some water in canteens in case we could find none throughout the day. Fortunately, we had a little water. We had a little which we brought from the camp three days before. My wife had been ill for some time with a severe attack of gastric fever. The second day, the weather being extremely warm, having only one quart of water left, I would give to her and the two little children each a spoonful at a time to moisten their throat. Late in the afternoon, our teens became so exhausted that they began to reel and stagger, seeming ready to drop down, and we had almost given up in despair. The water hunters, who had been constantly searching miles away from the train, came riding up, waving their hats, and shouting, water, water, water. The joy and gratitude of that moment no one can ever understand, unless they have passed through the same or a like experience. They had found pure, fresh water standing in pools in a ridge of sand hills about 10 miles away. The wagons were stopped, and the teams and other stock driven to the water. Some of them were so weak and exhausted they did not reach the water until near morning. While many of the men were attending to the stock, others were bringing water in kegs and canteens to the camp, and all alike forgetful of Indians. The next day, the teams were brought back and the wagons taken on to the water. That afternoon there occurred a fearful thunderstorm and a regular downpour of rain and hail. My wife was so prostrated with illness and fatigue that I had little hope that she could live. But after a few hours of rest and quiet, she revived and finally recovered. We rested at this place one week, resolving not to leave camp in the future without being assured of water at the next. About two weeks previous to this, while we were resting in the camp over Sunday, a band of Indians came dashing up in the afternoon stampeded the animals and driving off before our eyes about 35 head of horses and mules. 
It was all so sudden and our people so taken by surprise that for the moment they could do nothing. The first thing thought of was to get the women and children inside the corral of wagons and prepare for battle, for we knew not how many Indians were surrounding us, the camp being near a stream of water with timber and underbrush obstructing the view on every side. A consultation was immediately held, and it was decided to follow the Indians, and if possible, to bring back the animals, for we could neither go on nor return home without the team. Within a short time, 60 men had volunteered to go, while the rest were to remain in camp to protect the women and children. They hastily armed and equipped themselves, selecting the best horses left, and in less than an hour were in the saddle and off on the Indian trail. Those left at the camp hurriedly brought the remainder of the stock and tied them securely to the wagon, then placed sentinels all around to give alarm in case of attack. Thus was the night passed in the greatest suspense. The men in pursuit of the Indians rode all night long, coming upon the Indians early next morning. Our men were ready for battle, but the Indians, evidently surprised, sent a flag of truce and met them with protestations of friendship and agreed to give up the stolen horses, saying they mistook us for a caravan of Mexicans with whom they were at war and expressed contrition at having robbed us. And to prove their love for the Americans, the chief and about 30 others kindly escorted our men back to camp and as further proof of their affection, remained with us for two days, going from tent to tent, eating and feasting upon the best of our provisions. <laughs> Although grieved to see the depletion of our stores, we dared not refuse them, for being in the heart of their country, we knew we were completely in their power. On the 20th of May, shortly after the Indian episode, we had a sad duty to perform. Mr. N.S. Cyrus, one of the company which had been in bad health before leaving home, thought a trip across the plains might be beneficial to him. But instead of being restored as he had hoped, he gradually grew worse and died in less than two months. There were three ministers in the train, and after holding religious services, the body was laid coffinless in a deep dug grave, carefully covered, and then all the wagons in the train driven over it, to, so as to obliterate the site as much as possible to prevent desecration by Indians. Mr. Cyrus was the first of six of our little band who died on the way, one of whom was Francis E. Harrison, leaving a widow, now Mrs. G. W. Branch of Modesto, California, mother of Leon Branch of San Francisco. On leaving camp, at the Sandhill Pools, the next water found was the Pecos, or Pecos River, about 30 miles distant, a narrow, deep, swiftly flowing stream. Now, how were we to cross this river? Not a stick of timber, for aught we knew within hundreds of miles, large enough to make a raft. But such men as these were always ready for any emergency. They selected two close wagon beds, caulked them tightly so they were perfectly waterproof, tied empty kegs on each side to buoy them up, and fastened ropes at each end. Then two men swam across the river with the ropes, and by pulling the boats back and forth, everything was ferried over. The animals were driven into the river and swam across, and by evening the whole train was safely over and ready for marching. We caught a number of fine fish in this river, and also in other streams on the way, and occasionally killed deer and antelope and other smaller game, but never saw a buffalo or elk the whole route. Soon after crossing the river, we came into a good road made by a large train of emigrants from western Texas who had passed only three days before. What joy to know there were friends so near and like ourselves traveling in these wild wastes. And what relief to have a fine road ready-made for us. From here to El Paso, a distance of 200 miles, we met with little or no trouble, except from scarcity of water. The last 80 miles, there was so little water, we were forced to divide the company and travel in small parties of a few wagons, so that all might have a sufficiency. 
We arrived at El Paso the 2nd of July and celebrated the 4th in camp. The Mexicans were very friendly and hospitable. We purchased from them supplies of fresh vegetables, fruits, poultry, etc., which we gratefully enjoyed after our three months' journey in the wilderness. El Paso was to us truly an oasis in the desert. We remained at this place until the 14th. While here, the company broke up and scattered. Some few gave up and returned home by way of San Antonio. Many sold their wagons and other effects for what they could get and went on with pack trains. A few remained in El Paso, while the men with families and a few others, patient and level-headed men who were willing to travel slowly, organized and resumed their wearisome journey through the hostile Apaches to the gold fields of the Pacific coast. We crossed the Rio Grande about 100 miles above El Paso. The river was very full from the melting of snow in the mountains and the turbid waters running swiftly making the crossing dangerous, even in a good ferry boat. But we were forced to cross on a frail raft made of a canoe with a log pinned to each side and on these empty kegs fastened to prevent sinking or upsetting. The animals were driven into the river and swam across as at the Pecos River. How little the people of the present day think or know of these things as they ride along in their fine palace cars and cross these rivers on the grand trestle bridges. From the Rio Grande <coughs> to the Gila River, the journey was very pleasant. Although in the cactus country there was an abundance of grass and water and we were undisturbed by Indians, we rested a day or two at each Mexican village on the way, Santa Cruz, Tucson, etc., and went into and viewed the old mission church of San Javier and passed several old de deserted ranches with orchards full of luscious peaches. We found plenty of game, a number of wild cattle being killed by the party. Altogether, this part of the route was like a pleasure trip. But the journey down the Gila to the crossing of the Colorado was extremely difficult and laborious. A great portion of the way was sandy, and the heat and dust at times almost insupportable, and the team suffered greatly for want of grass. On reaching the Pima villages, we purchased wheat to feed them, taking with us all that we could haul. The seeds, or beans, of the mesquite tree growing near the mouth of the Gila proved to be the most nutritious food for horses and mules. On arriving at the Colorado, we found that a company of soldiers under Lieutenant Conte were stationed at the crossing for the protection of the immigrants. This was a great blessing, for the Yumas are a treacherous people and were literally swarming on both sides of the river. One of our party, the Reverend Mr. Payne, a Methodist minister, who had traveled on ahead of us arriving at the river some time before we did, rode out alone on horseback one afternoon to hunt. <coughs> Failing to return to camp, diligent search was made, but he was never seen or heard of more. It was supposed that the Indians killed him for his horse, gun, and clothing, hiding them away until the immigrants had all passed. At this river, there was a small flatboat to cross in, some little improvement on our former experience in crossing river. While we were encamped on the river bank awaiting our turn to cross, there occurred a terrible accident. Captain Thorne, who was on his way to California with a company of U.S. dragoons, accidentally fell from the boat with three of his soldiers and all were drowned. Captain Thorne's body was recovered and sent home to his family in New York. We crossed the river on the 19th of October, landing in safety on California soil just seven months after leaving home. But we had yet several hundred miles to travel before reaching our destination, and the great Mojave Desert, the worst part of the route, was still before us. In the mention in the meantime, woeful accounts of the desert were reported by returning gold seekers that the way was strewn with dead animals and wagons, that thousands of dollars worth of property of all kinds had been abandoned on the roadside, that there was great suffering among the people, many having lost everything, were trying to make their way on foot to the settlement. These reports 
were very disheartening to us, yet seemed to stimulate us to renewed effort. There was no alternative. We were obliged to go on at all hazards. We could not remain at the fort, as the soldiers were soon to return to San Diego. I had commenced the journey from home with three wagons, two large ones with a four-mule team to each, and a strong light running carriage for my family to ride in. Unfortunately, losing several head of horses on the way, I was forced to leave our wagon and go on the rest of the journey with but two, the family carriage and one larger wagon. When we crossed the Colorado, I still had the two wagons and eight fine mules. We remained at the river two days, purchasing supplies of provisions at the fort, gathering quantities of mesquite beans for the mules, and repacking the wagon, throwing out boxes, chests, utensils, and everything we could possibly dispense with to lighten the load. And with hearts full of courage and hope, we set out to cross the long, dreaded Sahara. We traveled slowly, mostly in the mornings and evenings, to save the team, for we knew all depended on them. We were 12 days in crossing. The first five days, we got along quite well, found sufficient water, though muddy, at wells along the way, and occasional small patches of grass. On the fifth day, arrived at New River. Here, the water was pure and fresh, and grass abundant. We rested at this place two days. Should have remained longer, but all were so eager to go on. From here to the end of the desert, the way was fearful. Very little water, and not a blade of grass nothing but a wild waste of sand. In many places, for miles at a time, the teams would sink in almost halfway to the knees at every step and the wagons halfway to the hub. The fifth day after leaving New River, the teams began to fail, so I was obliged to stop the wagons and send the mules on ahead six miles to water. The wind had been blowing a perfect hurricane all day, and clouds of dry sand almost blinded us. The storm was so furious that it was impossible to stretch a tent or build a fire to cook by, even if there had been any fuel. Our children were all day without food. The faithful cow, which had given them milk all the way from home, now failed us in this blighting desert. We quieted the little things as best we could through the night, and early next morning, Captain Fruitsfeld who was traveling with a party of Germans, called to see how we fared, and learning the situation, brought a small cake of cornbread, his only store of cooked food, and presented it to our children. Their mother saved a bit of this bread in a small glass case as a memento of those times. It kept almost perfect for over 20 years, but at present, after 40 years, there is only a speck of dust remaining in the glass. The teams were brought back about 10 o'clock, and we traveled on, reaching the end of the desert that afternoon. We now had plenty of water and grass, and our hearts were overflowing with joy and thanksgiving that we had at last reached the land of our hope and had nothing more to fear. From here, we went on slowly so that the teams might have time to recuperate, arriving at Warner's Ranch, called by the immigrant Haven of Rest, on November the 8th. Colonel Warner was very kind and obliging to the immigrants and having long been a resident of California was able to give us much useful information. We rested at this place one week and finally decided to go on to San Diego, sell our wagons and teams and go by water to San Francisco. But on arriving at San Diego, but on arriving at San Diego, we found that so many others had followed the same plan that wagons and mules were worth little or nothing at that place. I was offered only $15 per head for fine mules that I afterwards sold for two and three hundred in the mine, and wagons could hardly be given away. I felt that the sacrifice would be too great and so concluded to go up the coast by land. It has ever been with me an unsolved problem whether I should have sacrificed everything and gone to San Francisco at that time. Of course, the future of myself and family would have been entirely changed, but for better or for worse, 
I cannot tell. We stayed at the old mission of San Diego about six weeks, and on the 7th of January continued our journey up the coast. Traveling was delightfully pleasant a great and portion wagons of the and mules were worth little or nothing at that place. I was offered only $15 per head for fine mules that I afterwards sold for two and three hundred in the mine, and wagons could hardly be given away. I felt that the sacrifice would be too great, and so concluded to go up the coast by land. It has ever been with me an unsolved problem whether I should have sacrificed everything and gone to San Francisco at that time. Of course, the future of myself and family would have been entirely changed, but for better or for worse, I cannot tell. We stayed at the old mission of San Diego about six weeks, and on the 7th of January continued our journey up the coast. Traveling was delightfully pleasant a great portion of the way, when the weather was clear and warm. The hills and valleys were covered with green wild oats and clover being several inches high, and varied fields of wildflowers in the greatest profusion everywhere, the endless masses of Escolia appearing at the distance like blazes of fire. We were in no hurry, but went along slowly, staying a few days at each town along the way. The only trouble met with was from swollen streams and boggy roads after heavy rain. We arrived on the Tuolumne River, April the 14th, were very much pleased, and concluded to settle down. Thus ended our journey of nearly 13 months. We can now go on the rail cars to our old home in four days. I selected a beautiful location about two miles below LaGrange, the nearest mining camp, established a ferry, hotel, and store of general merchandise for trade with the miners, and put up large tents on canvas houses for all needs, as boards or planks were not to be had. Paid all hired help $125 per month, flour $30 per sack of 50 pounds, milk $1 per quart. Fresh butter, $3 per pound, and provisions of all kinds, proportionately high. Our experience at this place was varied and exciting. There was a great deal of travel at that time from Stockton and other points to the Mariposa and Burns Mine. And one day we would entertain Colonel Fremont, Lieutenant Beale, General Miller, and other noted persons and probably the next a lot of desperados passing through the country for the purpose of murder and robbery. Often a party of 15 or 20 miners came down and called for dinner. Then a band of eight digger Indians came to trade. All manner of people coming and going at all times of the day and night. One evening a party of five or six Mexicans rode by and camped for the night near the river in sight of the house. Early next morning, about the same number of desperate-looking white men rode up and asked if the Mexicans had crossed the river, and on being informed that they had taken the river road and were camped nearby, they went on, and in a short time we heard in quick succession about a dozen pistol shots. I knew what this meant, and hurriedly took my wife and children to the boat, telling the ferryman to take them across to the other side until the trouble was over, while I returned to the house to await the result. But my wife was so anxious for my safety that she begged the man to take them back, saying it was better for us all to die together. In less than half an hour, the white men came back to the hotel and ordered breakfast. They were very boisterous and said the Mexicans had stolen their horses and refused to give them up, and so they had killed two or three of them and even exhibited the belts of gold dust taken from the bodies of their victims. The Mexicans fled, taking with them their dead and wounded, and we never knew how many were really killed. We afterwards learned that the Mexicans were on their return home from the mines and were supposed to have a large amount of gold with them, that the story of the stolen horses was a fabrication, and the sole object in following them was robbery. Some time after this, a Mr. Ruddle left his home on the Merced to purchase supplies in Stockton and was killed and robbed in broad daylight within a few miles of our place. Such occurrences were frequent both in the mines and the country. No one was safe in traveling alone in those times. 
I must not omit to write something about the grizzly bears which infested this region in those early days. There was a great danger in hunting them. Mr. Mudgett, one of our comrades whose wife had died on the journey, settled with his children a few miles below us on the river. One day while out hunting, he shot a huge grizzly, wounding it severely, and before he could escape, the animal jumped upon him and tore him so badly that he died in a short time. Not long after this, an Indian was attacked by a large bear near LaGrange, and so severely hurt that for a long time his life was despaired of, but he finally recovered. The bear was killed and weighed 400 pounds. I myself met with a narrow escape from some grizzlies. I was riding over to Hornitos late in the afternoon, and when not far from Don Pedro's bar was going over a rising ground, I saw down in the valley about 80 yards ahead of me what I supposed to be some cattle browsing, but on a, a taking a second look, discovered three large grizzlies, one in the road sitting on his haunches, the other two standing nearby. I quietly turned my mule around and cantered home, happy in having avoided a near catastrophe. We remained at this place less than two years and carried on a very flourishing business all the while. And if the mines had held out, could have, in a few years, made a great amount of money. Unfortunately, my wife became very ill, as I supposed with an incurable illness. She was confined to bed three years and four months in an almost helpless condition, unable to walk a step in all that time. But contrary to all expectation, she finally recovered and has enjoyed comparative health ever since. And as she required my constant attention and the most careful nursing, I concluded to give up my interests here and try farming and stock raising. With this aim in view, I, in partnership with my brother, purchased 600 acres of choice land on the Merced River, about six miles below Snelling. A comfortable log cabin was built on the place, and we hurriedly cleared about 10 acres and planted all the varieties of vegetables and fruit seeds we could obtain, paying the most exorbitant prices for them. Paid as high as $20 per pound for onion seed. Planted in nursery some fruit trees purchased in San Jose at $3 a piece. Everything grew and flourished most luxuriantly, giving promise of an abundant harvest. But the floods came, and all was lost. The river overflowed the whole valley on both sides, from hill to hill. Our fine garden was completely swept away and destroyed. Not a dollar's worth was left. The water reached a depth of three feet in our house. It commenced to pour in over the floor about midnight. In a little while, the fire in the stove was drowned out, and by morning was two feet above the floor, and had almost reached the bed, whereon lay my invalid wife. I was entirely alone, my brother and a hired man having gone over on the Tuolumne to drive home some cattle, and were caught in the storm and unable to cross the sloughs to return home. We were also cut off from all help from the neighbors, there being no possible way for them to reach us. The water continued rising, and I, knowing the danger to the sick one if the flood should cover the bed, hastily tore up a floor plank, inserted one end in the wall under the bedstead, raising it half a foot, and placing the other end of the plank on a table. In this way, kept my wife and children above the surging water. In the meantime, trees and fences and all manner of debris went floating by. Our chicken house, with its freight of poultry was swept away except a few chickens which flew out and lighted on the tree. And for three fearful hours we expected every moment the house would go. But the house stood and we were saved. About three o'clock in the afternoon, the waters began to recede and by daylight next morning had entirely subsided. The terrible exposure through which I had passed and having to continue living in the damp house brought on a severe attack of pneumonia, and I lay for about 10 days hovering between life and death. Having naturally weak lungs, I was on recovery left in a very feeble state, unable to, in a very feeble state, and have never to this day been entirely relieved from the effects of this illness. 
So soon as I was sufficiently restored to be able to travel, I resolved to leave the Merced River forever and endeavor to find a more congenial home where overflows could never reach me. A friend residing at Santa Cruz advised me to go there, and I decided to go. But how to get there with my helpless wife? I prepared a swinging bed in a wagon and took her in this way to Stockton, then on a steamer to our destination. But after a six-week sojourn in Santa Cruz, found the climate there unsuited to my weak lungs. I then concluded to go to Venetia. That place had been highly recommended to me as having a delightful climate, a fine harbor, and being centrally located, the commercial facilities were all that could be desired. The state capital had recently been removed to that place, and the legislature was then in session. The future of Venetia seemed indeed to be very promising. On arriving there, I met an old neighbor from home, at that time residing in the town of Martinez, just across the strait. He said there was a beautiful sheltered valley back of town that he thought would suit me, as it had just the climate that I was seeking. I immediately went over with him to view out the land, and was so charmed with the location that I at once resolved to make this my resting place. Here was a lovely fertile valley, protected by high hills from the cold winds and fogs of San Francisco, a stream of living water flowing through it, the hills and valley partially covered with magnificent laurel, live oak, and white oak trees, and everywhere a green mantle of wild oats from 8 to 12 inches high. I knew at once that the valley was well adapted to fruit growing and thought I could realize my long cherished dream of a home surrounded by orange groves and all kinds of fruits and flowers where I can literally recline under my own vine and fig tree. I immediately purchased 20 acres of the richest valley land two and a half miles from town paying $50 per acre, and at once removed my family to the new home, they arriving on the 4th of April, 19, 1853. The valley at that time was known as Cañada del Hombre, or Valley of Hunger, so named by a company of Spanish soldiers sent by the governor of California to chastise some Indians, and failing to obtain a sufficiency of provisions in their disgust, called it Hungry Valley. Mrs. Stretzel, on arriving here, was much displeased with the name, and remembering Irving's glowing description of the flourishing paradise, of the Moorish paradise, decided to christen our new home Alhambra, and the valley has ever since been called Alhambra Valley. It would lengthen this narrative to two great dimensions, were I to write of all the ups and downs, trials and vicissitudes which I passed through during the first years of my long residence here of nearly 37 years, of the many difficulties I had to contend with in that early day in obtaining the right kind of seeds and trees for planting, often receiving invoices of trees and plants untrue to label, of the many losses and disappointments through inexperienced and unreliable help. But by energy and perseverance and unremitting attention to business, I succeeded in overcoming all obstacles. When my first tract of land was filled and I purchased more and continued to purchase when needed or opportunity offered and plant from year to year up to the present time. My brother continued with me until his death in 1865. He was very energetic a kind-hearted, benevolent man, and being my only relative, his death was a great blow to me. But the greatest trial of our lives was the death of our only son, a bright, promising boy of nine years who died of diphtheria in September 1857. For years we were inconsolable. The light and hope of our lives seemed to have gone out with him. And now, in our old age, we feel the need of him even more than we did at first. Our daughter, Louie Wanda, was educated in Benicia at the Atkins Seminary for Young Lady. She is a very intelligent and intellectual, uh, a great lover of the beautiful in nature and art, and is passionately fond of flowers and music, is benevolent and kind to everyone, 
ever ready to relieve suffering and to assist in all good work, is social and amiable in disposition, and a most devoted mother. She is married to John Muir, the well-known geologist and botanist, has two lovely little daughters, Wanda and Lillian, but no son. She always has been and still is a great comfort and help to her parents. On her marriage, I gave her the old house and built up for myself a new one down in the valley, one mile near her town. My faithful companion and I live very comfortably and quietly in our declining years. We have a commodious house with pleasant surroundings in the midst of orchards and vineyards in full view of Martinez and Venetia and the two overland railroads, the Central and Southern Pacific. We do not travel or visit much, but take great pleasure in having our friends visit us. In politics, I am a Republican, have always taken deep interest in the continued welfare and prosperity of my adopted country have an abiding faith in the permanency of American institutions and the perpetuity of the Union. The Chinese question is not receiving that earnest consideration that its giant form looming in the near future should require. The Tartar invasion of Europe brings to mind historical data which can be report, repeated in our day on a larger scale. A population assumed to be 400 millions and getting rapidly educated in the ways of aggression. A leader is apt to arise who can handle and throw this potent force for the invasion en masse of the Pacific states. This horde of locusts is already spreading over the country in their insidious way, crowding out of employment our own people and securing the outcrop of their labor for investment in China a manner of depletion of our resources not permitted to the same extent by any other people or nation. A time will come when they can do this forcibly, if not timely restricted. I have always been a Lutheran, but feel very liberal toward all denominations, and have ever stood with open hand ready to assist in building churches and aiding all religious and educational institutions tending to the amelioration and happiness of mankind. I have no faith in creed and dogma, but believe in pure religion <coughs> and pure religion that teaches love to God and our fellow men. Have a firm and enduring faith in immortality and believe with St. Paul in the living identity of the spirit, body after death. I have taken active interest in the Grange or Order of Patrons of Husbandry ever since its organization and have been for many years master of the Sorbordinate Grange and president of the Grangers Business Association of Martinez. The Grange being a social and education institution, I believe much good can be accomplished through it if the original inceptions of its founders can be faithfully carried out. I am also president of the Martinez Gas and Electric Light Company and a stockholder in the Martinez Bank. This is about all the office holding that I have ever engaged in, not having a penchant for such things. I am of medium height, light build, blue eyes, brown curly hair, now very white, florid complexion, am earnest in conversation, abstemious in diet, do not use alcoholic stimulants or tobacco. Through life, I have endeavored to act fairly and equitably with my fellow men, strictly following the golden rule, and taking pleasure in assisting the needy according to my ability. We begin to realize that our life's work is drawing to its close, that our journey is almost ended. We feel we are nearing the borderland and are calmly and peacefully awaiting the summit to cross over the river. That was my great great grandfather, Dr. John Strengthen. <laughs> he might be alarmed a little bit today to realize that his fear of the Chinese invasion has actually come true because he has a great 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 granddaughter from China now <laughs> that my sister adopted uh, a few years ago. So, 
Maybe that really did happen. <laughs> I was interested in how he described himself of medium height and light build. He was five feet tall and weighed 90 pounds. <laughs> he was a tiny little fellow. I don't know where I came from. Where is the other house? Where was the house after he gave? Well, that's a good question for the Martinez Historical Society. Where are they? Does anybody know where the other Spencil house is in town? Okay. Well, that's why I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting that what everyone knows is the John Muir House or the John Muir National Historic Site is really the Strensel House. That's why the house burned down when they first called it. They went to the Strensel House. Yeah. 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 Well, that's about all the Martinez history I have for you today. I have letters from my great-great-grandmother, but we'll save that for another time. Was that written as a journal, or was it written as a memoir toward the end of his life? I, I think as a, as a memoir, toward, toward the end of his life, you know, when people feel compelled to do, do an accounting. Um, the letter that I have of his wife, my great-great-grandmother, is more immediate. It's something that she wrote after arriving at the Mission San Diego in 1849, an account of their trip across the plains. And it's a little more intense and personal from a mother's point of view. And it actually inspired me reading that, that she could do that trip with a, you know, a little infant son and a toddler daughter and trek across that incredible desert that she could do that, it made me believe that I could do that too. And we hitched our horses at the Mission San Diego. We used her diary to map a route, and we hitched our horses at the Mission San Diego, and we went backwards all the way to, we made Honey Grove, Texas. We left uh, San Diego at the end of January, and we arrived in Honey Grove, Texas on the 4th of July, where I met distant relatives of mine that descend from Sam Irwin that still live there today. The Irwins still live in Texas and their distant cousins, and we went on from there and followed the path that the generations before them came through Oklahoma and Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, and we went all the way to Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, the 1,529 acres out toward Crockett, what, what did they do out there? Did they grow something? Or well, Dr. Strenzel was, a, was really a, a very broad-based fruit grower, vegetable grower, orchards, and vineyards. He was one of the early winemakers in California, commercial winemakers. We had a medal that we uh, got, got from the State Fair in New Orleans uh, for his wine that he made. Um, I, I understood that at one time he owned 6,000 acres, stretching from the waterfront you know, the entire Alhambra Valley, and I don't know really the, the basis of this. And again, the, maybe the Martinez Historical Society would know more about it. And I don't know what became of all that land, because by the time, you know, it came down to my father after the Depression, um, there was not 6,000 acres left. There, there, there wasn't. The farm, the old farmhouse that he grew up in, um, he inherited, and he sold that and the land on it for $10,000 to get the money to build his house for his bride and raise his family. My father uh, is the youngest of John Muir's 10 grandchildren. John Muir had two daughters. They, uh, Helen had four sons, and my grandmother Wanda had five sons and a daughter. And my dad is the youngest of those 10 and the only one left living. In the reading, it said Lillian instead of Helen. Did she have two names? Well, yes. Um, it's described as Lillian here, but her name was uh, Lillian Helen, I guess, and she was known as Helen. And I'm not exactly sure what my grandmother's exact 
christened name is. I believe it says Annie Wanda on her headstone. But the women who came before her were known as Louis for Louisiana, and the generation before that, Louisiana. So whether she was Louisiana Wanda, known as Annie Wanda, and then later Wanda, I don't know. On her headstone, it says Annie Wanda. Well, thank you for, yeah. Just an oddball fact that people don't know it, but of the eight, your children, all the way from Dunbar, Scotland, four of them are buried here in Martinez. Yes. Hmm. Yes. John, both brothers of John Muir? Both brothers. And one sister? Uh, no, Margaret and Sarah both. Okay, two sisters. Two sisters and two brothers. Yeah, okay. My, my uncle John Muir Hanna, who would be a hundred next month if he was still alive, he died last December. He was a crusty old fellow, and he was one of, uh, one of uh, Wanda's five sons, and he was the smallest of the five. But uh, when he was an infant, John Muir's uh, sister had twin children, and she was very, very ill, and she nearly died, and the, and the twins were very ill and they were raised at the breast of my grandmother along with my Uncle John, so he claims he's the shortest of the five because he was raised on short rations. <laughs> <laughs> he was really an adventurer too. When he was 10 years old, he and my Uncle Strent, who was the, the oldest grandchild of John Muir, born in 1907, he'd be 102 this year. When they were 10 and 12, they they dried beef jerky and packed their horse, uh, their horses' saddlebags, and they set out and rode to Yosemite for the summer. And uh, they made their living racing. One of their horses was fast, and my uncle John was a jockey, and they bet and raced the horse and make money that way. And they traveled all around. They they made another trip all the way up to Mount Shasta, just cruising around the countryside, something that little kids wouldn't be doing today. Well, thank you all very much for coming. She obviously knew how to read and write, and, and she had an education, but it came with a great deal of freedom and a great sense of adventure. And, you know, that passed to, to the next generation, that love of nature, and the feeling that, you know, you can set out and do things, and you can find your path in the world. And my family never discouraged me from doing the things that I loved. You know, I, I loved animals, and I, I loved horses. And I was not discouraged from, from choosing that as a career as opposed to being a lawyer or something more traditional. And I did become a horseman. I did follow my love with, with that. And 
I, uh, I reached the point because I have MS and I've had several hip surgeries, I got to where I couldn't ride. I, I learned to drive horses and I was introduced to the idea of using wheelchair accessible carriages to enhance people's ability to get around in nature the way I use them myself. And that led to founding this organization called Access Adventure, which provides, and that's what the work that we do today. And, you know, I'm sure that, that part of that comes from this pioneer spirit that I descend from. You know, the fact that they can do these things, and, and that love of nature that was instilled in his family by John Muir, that, that's, that still, still happens. And that's how we, we came to do the work that we do now.